The first thing I want all of you to understand is that I'm Richard's younger sister. <laughs> so this is a picture of my brother and I. My brother, I think, must have been about 15. He still had his tie uh, tied and a clean shirt. I'm not sure about later. This is, this is me dressed up uh, in my fencing outfit. Uh, I never learned to fence, but I, this was uh, shortly after I got married, and I wanted to be sure of myself. <laughs> okay, next slide. This is a, my family. My father, mother, big brother, and me. We were a very happy family. We loved each other very much. There was a lot of laughter in our house, and Richard and I didn't fight. Uh, so thinking of those years were, always makes me happy. Now I want to introduce, you all know about Richard, I just want to introduce me a little bit. <laughs> I got a PhD in physics in 1957. I had three kids, four grandkids. I've worked on space science and climate change for more than 50 years, and I've published 185 papers, give or take 20. <laughs> okay, the nicest places I worked were Lamont, which was Columbia University's geophysical laboratory, and the Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, it, which I think a lot of you are aware of. I also worked, uh, I always worked in geophysics, Earth-Sun relationships, and climate change. I retired in 2017, good health, and two weeks later, I fell down the stairs and broke my arm, which is why I limp. I also um, got awarded a NASA, a NASA Exceptional Science Achievement. Uh, and I am still as happy about that as it shows in this picture. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if Ed Stone is around, or you know Ed Stone, but yeah, that's Ed Stone. <laughs> <laughs> Made it. He was the director at JPL when I was there. Uh, Richard and I, when we were both kids, Richard was my first teacher. I was his lab assistant. My first paid job <laughs> for four cents a week. He had a, a, a like a, well, it was a, a, a magnetic field and electricity uh, lab. I had s several important things to do. He had boxes near the lab and I would climb up on the box and when told to, I would pull a switch. <laughs> <laughs> well, after all, I was uh, six, seven. Uh, and, uh, okay, uh, one day, my mother was a housewife, which in those days she, meant she had the afternoons off. And uh, she had a, was one day having a bridge game, and she got the feeling something was wrong. So she said to me, Joni, would you go see if Richard's okay? And so I said, sure. I was six, seven and I went down the hall and opened the door, and there was my brother Richard with the window open, his hand out the window, holding a wastebasket 
full of papers which were burning. <laughs> Looked like that. So I said, Richard, are you okay? <laughs> and he said, yes. A and I went back and said, Richard's okay. Later on, well, Richard showed me all sorts of things in nature. And one night, I was asleep already, and my mother permitted him to come into my room and wake me up because there was an aurora on, at the golf course, which was two blocks away. And so he took me to the golf course, and I looked up. And it didn't look like this, but it looked like this less so. <laughs> and he said, nobody knows how it happens. And I thought that was very, very interesting. And so I ended up studying Aurora much later. My brother also taught me to add numbers when I was about three years old. He would say the numbers and I would say the answer. And if I got it right, he had to give me a gift of some sort. So uh, he would say one plus four, and I would say five, and he would say right. Then it was my, I had the privilege of grabbing his hair and pulling it in terrible places because it hurts so much. <laughs> now, it was not until I started writing this address that I tried pulling my hair and discovered it doesn't hurt. <laughs> okay. We also uh, listened, and I lived, we lived in Far Rockaway, New York, which had a lot of thunderstorms and lightning. And um, the, if you are at the place where the lightning takes place, then the thunder and lightning happen at the same time. But if you're a distance away, the light travels very fast and the thunder being sound travels much more slowly. So if you, if you uh, count the time between the time you see lightning and the time you hear the storm, you can estimate the distance it is from you to the event actually took place. And so I learned to count and we used to count lightning one hippopotamus, two hippopotamus, three hippopotamus. If you say one hippopotamus, that's one second. And uh, we time, timed it to make sure and that was right. So we, we had a method of measuring the distance to the lightning, which was very exciting. When I learned something, my mother was impressed with his teaching ability. not my learning. <laughs> my mother warned me, women's brains can't do science. Well, I was very sorry about that. I cried a bit. But that's what my mother told me. And in the years since, I've had many women come to my office and say, my mother told me women can't do science. Or my counselor told me women can't do science. Or my rabbi told me women can't do science. And I was lucky. Richard gave me a book on astronomy. And there was a picture in it by a woman named Payne Gropochkin. And it showed her data. And I realized Payne Gropochkin, a double name like that, was a married woman, 
and she had her science data published in a textbook, so I knew that you didn't have to be Marie Curie. There was only one Marie Curie. When it was time to me to go to college, my father, who became ill uh, with high blood pressure while my mother was pregnant with me. Uh, well, and if you had high blood pressure in those days, they had no medicine. They didn't know to, to tell you not to eat salt. They told you to do nothing. But my father was making a living. And my mother didn't know how to make a living. She wasn't taught to make a living. So my father continued to work. But my, when I went to college, my father told me to learn to make a living because you never know what life brings. Only men made good livings in those days. And so I figured I'd better go into a man's profession. I chose physics and hoped to be some sort of an assistant. My brother urged me to work hard to be the very best I could. It took courage uh, to be a woman, and determina a woman scientist, and determination and hard work. I got courage from various things. Uh, in the Jewish religion, after the men go to the Sabbath uh, Friday night service, when they come back to their home, they're supposed to say the praise of a virtuous woman. And one of the praises of the line goes, she seeth the vineyard and buyeth it. That's in the Old Testament. It's not she seeth a, a, a vineyard and it looks pretty good to her, so she goes and asks her husband whether they should think about buying it. <laughs> so, um, my grandmother, after whom I was named, was a watchmaker and also a milliner making hats. And this is a picture of my grandmother, and I think you can see from it she was a determined and wealthy woman. So she was part of my, uh, gave me courage. Okay, this is a saying of my brother, Richard. The job of a scientist is to listen carefully to nature, not to tell nature how to behave. Not to tell nature, I have a beautiful theory and you ought to follow it. It's up to nature. If it doesn't agree with nature, it's wrong. That's the end of it. This uh, last uh, slide is my brother as a United States postage stamp. <laughs> now, uh, m there are many Nobel laureates, but only four scientists uh, have been depicted on postage stamps. And it was a great honor for him to be so uh, the, the four scientists have been Willard Gibbs, who did uh, thermodynamics in the last century, Johnny von Neumann, uh, Clintock, and my brother. Uh, when Richard went to visit his friends, the children just loved to play with him. And you, if it was breakfast time, which it often was, you couldn't get them to the breakfast table. So Richard and his uh, a companion devised a song, which they 
drummed and sang to uh, in order to get the kids to the breakfast table. It's called orange juice. <laughs> and uh, it will be, okay, there they go. Can I hear that? I can't hear it. Can you make it louder? <laughs> this last slide sort of says how he lived and died. He's there playing the drums with a big smile on his face. And those are supposed to be Feynman diagrams, which are used to calculate the uh, way that uh, light, electrons, and light, and protons interact. Uh, and as you could see, he enjoyed he enjoyed his life very much. He got uh, he worked on the bomb, uh, and uh, he as when he got to be in his sixties. He came down with two major rare uh, cancers, and so he died. When he was on the verge of dying, he got more conscious. You could see him struggling, and what his last words were, this dying is boring. I wouldn't want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs>